Hey everyone, I am Ms. Hu, your physics teacher. In this video, we are going to go through one of the methods of scientific investigation. Now, you should be aware there are many different types of scientific investigation. This particular video will be focusing on conducting a practical investigation to determine the relationship between two variables. So for this particular kind of scientific investigation, there is a series of steps that we should follow in order to complete the investigation. And these are the steps. So what we're going to go through now are these 10 steps. And we're going to take a problem as an example to see how to complete this kind of scientific investigation. First of all, let's go through an example of the problem we could encounter. Typically, when it comes to physics, this should be a real world problem that you could actually encounter. And of course, we would try to conduct an experiment that we can conduct in the lab. So let's say for this example, we find a problem with a pendulum clock. Now, this pendulum clock is found to be running too slow. A student found that by decreasing the length of the pendulum, the time for the minute hand to move is lesser. So there's a problem, and of course, the student did find some kind of solution. But what we want to do is to find out what is the relationship between these two variables. So first of all, we need to make an inference. From the problem just now, we can infer that changing the length of the pendulum changes its period of oscillation. That's why the minute hand takes less time to make its complete round. So how do we write an inference? An inference is just a general relationship between two identified variables. So we can write that the length of the pendulum affects its period of oscillation. Now that we have identified the two variables we want to study, we need to build a hypothesis. How we write a hypothesis is a general relationship between the two variables, showing the positive or negative trend. In this slide, I've shown you two ways you can write the hypothesis. You can write when the pendulum length increases, the period of oscillation increases, or you can write the greater the pendulum length, the greater the period of oscillation. So when writing the hypothesis, make sure that when you write it, you show the cause and effect. That means you show how the change in the manipulated variable changes the responding variable. In physics, the order in which you write these variables are important because you need to show the cause and effect. That means which one causes the effect in the other variable. Both of the methods I've written here in this slide are acceptable. Now, we need to identify the variables. There are three variables in general that you would need to identify for these kind of experiments. You need to identify the manipulated variable, also sometimes known as the independent variable, the responding variable, which is also sometimes known as the dependent variable, and the constant variable, which is also sometimes known as the controlled variable. The manipulated variable is the variable that we will change. In this case, the length of pendulum. That means if we were to conduct the experiment, we would change the length of the pendulum. The responding variable is a value that we would measure, in this case, the period of oscillation. The constant variable is the one that we have to keep constant throughout the entire variable. In most experiments, this would be the variable which, if you don't keep constant, can also change the value of the responding variable. To identify the constant variable, usually it's one of the other factors which affects the responding variable. For this particular experiment, we will keep the mass of the pendulum bob constant. Now, bear in mind that the experiment that we want to conduct has to be one that we can conduct in the lab. So it doesn't have to be anything to do with the pendulum clock. It just has to be about the pendulum, the length, and the period of oscillation. So when we want to determine the list of materials and apparatus, these are all materials and apparatus that can be found in the lab. In this case, we are going to conduct a pendulum experiment. So we need the string, the pendulum bob, a meter rule to measure the length, a retort stand with which to hold the pendulum, and a stopwatch to measure the time. By the way, the term pendulum refers to the combination of the string and the pendulum bob. 
Some people think that the term pendulum just refers to the pendulum bob. No, the bob is the thing that we hang the string from. The pendulum bob combined with the string, that's the pendulum. That's why in order to measure the length of the pendulum, we measure the entire length of the string up to the center of mass of that pendulum bob. Next, we need to plan the procedure of the experiment. Remember that we need to be able to conduct this experiment in the lab. So the first thing we should do is set up the apparatus and materials. That's why we've written here as step one, the apparatus and materials are set up as shown in the diagram. Now remember that a picture paints a thousand words. So for physics, because sometimes the setup can be a little bit complicated. So that's why we have a diagram to show the setup, which is so much easier than trying to write out the entire description and explanation as to how to set things up. If you look at the diagram, it's so clear and obvious as to how we should set up all the apparatus and materials we have read in the previous slide. Next, we would need to explain what we do with the manipulated variable. So first, we need to determine the initial value of the manipulated variable we want to use. That's why you can see in step two, the length of the pendulum is adjusted to 100 cm. It's also a good idea to indicate in the diagram how you'd measure the length. So that's why in the diagram, we have a double-headed arrow to show how the length of the pendulum should be measured. Next, we need to describe how we're going to conduct the experiment. So what we'll do is in step three, the pendulum bob is displaced slightly and released. After we've released the pendulum bob, in reality, you'll find that the pendulum will start to oscillate. So next, we need to write down what we want to measure and record. So the time for 10 complete oscillations is recorded. Now remember, the responding variable is a period of oscillation. The term period of oscillation here means the time for one complete oscillation. That's why in step five, we have the period of one oscillation calculated using the formula of taking the time for 10 complete oscillations divided by 10, and we record this value. In case you're wondering, why don't we just measure the period of one oscillation right away? Think about it. Is it easy to measure the period of one oscillation? It can be quite difficult. So that's why we have decided to take the time for 10 complete oscillations instead, and it will just calculate the average of the time for one complete oscillation from that and use that as the period of oscillation. Now, because we want to determine the relationship between the length of pendulum and its period of oscillation, you can't do this experiment just one time. You'll have to repeat this using other different values. One of the best ways to determine the relationship is by drawing a graph. So if we want to draw a graph, ideally, we should have five sets of data. So that's why in the final step here, we will repeat this experiment with four additional lengths, 80, 60, 40, and 20 cm. That will give us in total five sets of values, including the initial value of 100. If you want to do more values, by all means, go ahead. The minimum is five. If you want to do more, it's even better. Now, this is only the planning stage. So what do we have to do next? We'll actually have to conduct the experiment so that we can get the data with which we can analyze and find out is the hypothesis true or not. So I have included over here a snippet from a video that I have made when I was conducting this experiment at home. Yes, I actually have a video that shows you how to conduct this pendulum experiment at home. If you'd like to find out more, go and watch that video. So you can see here that the pendulum bob is oscillating and you need to use your stopwatch to measure the time for 10 complete oscillations. Remember that one complete oscillation is from one extreme point all the way to the other and back to its original position. That's one complete oscillation. Now we need to tabulate the data. So based on our procedure, we would need to measure and record the following values. First, you must have your manipulated variable, which is the length of the pendulum. And then we measured and recorded the time for 10 oscillations. And from that, we will calculate and record the period of one oscillation. 
So when we want to tabulate the data, make sure that you've written the unit in a header and the values that you write inside the table itself are only the values. You don't have to write the units. So here we only have a blank table because we only have the values for our manipulated variable. If you haven't conducted the experiment, you won't have the values to fill in this table. Now let's say we have already conducted this experiment and we've recorded the values. Remember that when you are recording the values, all of the numbers in the same column must have the same number of decimal places. The values that you write for measured quantities must follow the sensitivity of the measuring instrument used. For example, the length of the pendulum is measured using a meter rule. Even if you don't use a meter rule, it would be a ruler. And a ruler has one decimal place when you're measuring in centimeters. That's why you must record the values of the length of the pendulum with one decimal place. Even though it's a nice round number, you must add the trailing zero to indicate the one decimal place of the meter rule. When we measured the time for 10 oscillations, we used a stopwatch. So you must record the values following the sensitivity of the stopwatch. The stopwatch that I had used only has one decimal place. If you use the stopwatch with two decimal places, then you must write to two decimal places. Now, for the period of oscillation, it's a calculated value, and it's based on taking the time for 10 oscillations divided by 10. So that would give us an additional decimal place. So that's why for my data, the period of one oscillation has two decimal places, one more than the time for 10 oscillations. If you had two decimal places for the time for 10, then you should have three decimal places for the period of oscillation. Now that we have our data, we would need to analyze it. And for these kind of experiments, the best way to analyze all this data is to draw a graph. So we're going to draw a graph of period of oscillation against length of pendulum. Remember that when we're plotting a graph, normally the responding variable goes on the y-axis and the manipulated variable goes on the x-axis. Here's a simplified graph that I have plotted. Well, in my case, I used a uh, computer software, but for you students, you should be using an actual graph paper and drawing it with a pencil. So here we have a graph of period of oscillation against length of pendulum. And as you can see, the data kind of curves upwards. Now that we have our graph, we can come up with a conclusion. And remember that the conclusion is always based on our hypothesis. Let's recall what a hypothesis is. The hypothesis is about the relationship between the length of the pendulum and period of oscillation. The increase in the length of pendulum will have an increase in the period of oscillation. Now, look at the graph. Is that hypothesis true? Yes, it is, right? Because the graph shows a positive trend. And that's our conclusion. So the conclusion is that the period of oscillation increases with the length of the pendulum. And yes, the hypothesis is accepted. And that's how we conduct a scientific investigation. By the way, some of you may be aware that the pendulum experiment is actually a little bit more complicated than this. Some of you may have conducted an experiment which requires you to measure the time for 10 complete oscillations two times, and then you got to take the average of that before you calculate the period of oscillation. Some of you may have done experiments where you don't just stop at the value of the period of oscillation, you even need to square that value. All of that will be covered in another video, which I will do, that will focus solely on this pendulum experiment. In this video, we're keeping it simple just to look at a general overview of how to conduct a scientific investigation. If you're wondering, is this actually all we need for a scientific investigation? Normally, yes. All the additional stuff of repeating the investigation or squaring values and all that are pretty unique to certain experiments only. In fact, in some experiments, it can be even simpler where you only need to record two values, just a manipulated and responding, and you don't even need to do additional calculations involving the responding variable.
don't worry, there will be more videos about all those different experiments and how to write up reports for those experiments. So if you'd like to keep updated about all those different videos on different lab experiments, as well as how to write reports, or even lessons, solutions, and exam strategies, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Physics Rocks. If you'd like a more complete overview of the SPM and IGCSC physics syllabus, as well as experiments, please visit my website at physicsrocks.com. Happy studying!